Now, although we're done talking about all of the different bacteria that you might encounter in the clinical laboratory, this lecture we are talking about a different organism, and these are the viruses. And this lecture has been broken up into five different parts, and this is the first part. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to list the properties of viruses, to draw and describe the structure of a virus, to discuss the diseases caused by each DNA virus, including the clinical manifestations as well as transmission, list the diseases caused by the RNA viruses, and discuss the clinical manifestations, transmission, and unique characteristics of each, as well as define a prion and discuss the, the diseases associated associated with prion infection. So a virus, it's very different than a bacteria. We've mentioned viruses in the past when we were talking about some of the other intracellular organisms like rickettsia and like chlamydia. I mentioned that because they are obligately intracellular, they are sort of like a virus. However, they are very different than a virus. Viruses are structurally very different than bacteria. So your chlamydia and your rickettsial organisms are actual bacteria. They're just obligately intracellular. Viruses are a nucleic acid genome that's surrounded by a protein co. So they're very different than a bacteria, whereas a bacteria is a, a true cell a single-celled organism that has a nucleus with a genome inside of it and all sorts of organelles. A virus is, is much more simplistic than that, where it has the nucleic acid genome surrounded by this protein coat that's called a capsid. Now, a nucleocapsid is the genome plus the capsid together, that protein coat. Now, the genomes of viruses can be either RNA genomes or DNA genomes, whereas in our bacteria, our bacteria are more like human cells, where you have your genome that contains your DNA, and then your DNA is uh, transcribed into messenger RNA and then translated into proteins. So viruses are different in where they can have an RNA or a DNA genome. Now the capsid or that protein coat is composed of these subunits called capsomeres and they can be irregular in shape. So there's different shapes of the capsomeres that can make viruses various shapes. So we talked about shapes with bacteria. Well viruses do have very different shapes to them. Now the larger viruses have a lipid envelope and some viruses have these glycoprotein spikes that come off of the surface. Not all of the viruses do, but some do. And these glycoprotein spikes can act as attachment projections and allows the virus to attach to the cell that it likes to infect. The virion is the nucleic acid plus the protein coat or the capsid along with the envelope and the glycoprotein. So you have your virus particle that contains the central core which is either DNA or RNA nucleic acid molecules. You have your coating your covering of your core which is the capsid and then some viruses but not all viruses also have an envelope. There are some viruses that are called naked viruses that don't have any envelope. So to the left in this slide you have a naked virus which is just the nucleocapsid. You have your nucleic acid surrounded by the capsid that's it, no envelope. On the right hand side is a schematic of an enveloped virus where you have your nucleic acid, then your capsid, the protein coat surrounding it, and then all around that you have an envelope. And then we already said some viruses, but not all, do have these glycoprotein spikes coming off of them. 
So hopefully you have had um, learned about viruses in a general microbiology class where you talked a lot more about the structure and a lot of the different properties of the viruses. We're not going to talk about that in this course because we're talking about clinical microbiology. So really we're only concerned with the organisms that cause human disease and the organisms you might be looking for in the clinical microbiology laboratory. So hopefully you all remember the, this list of the properties of viruses. You remember your viruses are obligately intracellular. So you have viruses that can be live inside of eukaryotic cells. Remember you have your bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. Now viruses are ultra microscopic in size. They are smaller than bacteria. So remember we look at bacteria under the microscope. We can't see them under with our naked eye. Well viruses are even smaller than that. They are not cellular in nature. We already said bacteria are cells. They're prokaryotic cells. Whereas viruses aren't a, actually a cell. Um, they need to live inside of a, of a cell in order to function. So unlike bacteria that you could streak out on a plate or stick in broth and they'll grow, viruses aren't going to grow in a petri dish on agar like a bacteria will. So viral replication, we already said these are obligately intracellular. They range in size from about 20 nanometers to about 300 nanometers. The pox virus is the largest of all the known viruses. And even though it's the largest virus, it's still only one quarter of the size of Staphylococcus. So we, it's very large for viruses, but for bacteria, it's still small. They are strictly intracellular, and there are various steps in viral replication. We're going to mention these steps, but we're not going to go through every stage in detail. Hopefully you have had all of these um, things in a general microbiology course. So in the infectious cycle of a virus, you have your attachment phase where the virus is recognizing a host cell and the glycoprotein spikes are going to bind to that host cell and the receptors on the host cell. Now the thing about viruses, there's something called viral tropism viruses will only infect certain types of cells. So if a virus gets into your body, it doesn't mean that it can get in and infect any cell in your entire body. Viruses cannot do that. They can only infect very specific cell types and that's what viral tropism is. Now the next stage in the infectious cycle is penetration and that's where the virus is going to enter into the cell after it attaches. So you get the fusion of the viral envelope with the cellular membrane. You can also have fusion of nearby host cells. So when you, when you have a viral infection that causes a bunch of host cells to fuse together and make this massive multinucleated what looks like a bunch of cells but it's a mass of cells stuck together, that's called syncytia. Some viruses do this and it, it can be a very diagnostic feature of some viruses. The next stage is uncoding and then synthesis. So once the virus gets inside of the cell, it is going to lose that protein coat so that it releases that genome, that RNA or DNA genome. And then you have synthesis where you are going to produce nucleic acid and proteins. And viruses need the host cell to do this. They need the host cell machinery. They cannot reproduce on their own. You'll then get viral assembly. 
so once you copy the viral genome and some of the proteins you then are going to reassemble this virus into virions. Now the viral classification. You can classify vir viruses based on their morphology. So is their protein coat or their capsid an icosahedral shape? Is it irregular in shape? Um, we'll talk about some of the shapes that are very characteristic to certain bacteria, um, viruses. Sorry. Also, more commonly, they're classified by their type of genome. Are they DNA viruses or are they RNA viruses? Are they single-stranded or are they double-stranded? And also their means of replication. Viral pathogenesis, you can get viruses through person-to-person -person transmission. Viruses can infect susceptible cells only. We already said they can infect every cell in the body. Once they do infect a susceptible cell though, you get viremia. So you get virus in your bloodstream. That tends to lead to secondary infections. So a lot of people that will get a viral infection, let's say you get a viral respiratory infection. You're, so you're coughing and you know starting to you know get a runny nose and things. It it commonly is a virus. What can happen though is due to the irritation of the tissue, you can then get a secondary bacterial infection. Usually once the virus is maintained in the body, that's when you might get some symptoms. You're going to um, mount a, an immune response so hopefully you will start generating a cell mediated immune response and then develop some antibodies against the virus that will stop the virus from replicating. You can get tissue damage, you can get lysis of cells, and some viruses, a lot of different viruses, will remain latent in the body. So you might not have any more symptoms or you may never get symptoms. The virus is there and just stays in the body and you never know. You have no idea it's there. Sometimes it's there, stays in the body, and years later it will come out and you will start to get symptoms. And that's the only way you find out that, hey, you were actually infected with this specific virus. Now viruses like bacteria can be transmitted in a variety of ways. You can have respiratory or aerosol transmission. You can ingest viruses through the fecal oral route. You can get viral infections through trauma, through injections, through tissue and blood transplantations and transfusion through arthropod vectors, mosquitoes, various types of biting insects, through animal, animal bites, as well as vertically, from an infected mother to the child transplacentally. We're going to move on to the second part of the virology lecture. So this was just a brief overview of your basic uh, viral characteristics that hopefully was an overview from a more extensive virolo virology lecture that you had either in a virology course or in a general microbiology course.